Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the New Year Bible broadcast on the YouTube channel. This is Church Media, TT, and we have always been presenting to you the Word of God in its simplicity and in its truth. So I trust that you were not only encouraged, but you would have had the opportunity to think about what is being presented and consider a change of life, a change of heart, a change of attitude, and more so that change being promoted by the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so for your continued viewership, we are thankful for you being there. And we pray that God will bless you and your family richly in all things. This is the first time for the year I'm coming to you, so let me also say Happy New Year to all our loyal viewers. And we do continue to pray that God will bless you and your family, that you'll be successful and prosperous in this new year, year 2023. Now we know it's not going to be exempted from trials and or sort of tribulations that we would face in life. We know that we will go through a lot of stuff, but we are thankful that God is there to help us in that path that we do not even foresee. And that is to say, we cannot tell what will happen tomorrow, but God has given us today. And because of that, we are saying, Lord, thank you. So let's go before Heavenly Father, indeed in prayer, before we proceed with our lesson. Eternal God and righteous Father, you being the giver of life, health, and strength, you being the one who provides for us, who sustains and protects. We continue to look upon you, dear God, for such guidance and mercies in our lives. Father, as we live daily, we know that there will be many things that will challenge our lives and challenge even who we are, meaning Christians. We pray, dear God, that you will help us to endure and that we will be able to overcome, putting our faith and trust in you. We pray, Father, for those who have not yet obeyed your wonderful gospel, that they would strongly consider doing so before it is eternally too late. We pray that programs like this one, the New Year Bible Broadcast, will help minds and hearts to be open, that your word will be received with meekness. So we ask, dear God, your blessings, your guidance, and your mercies always. For it is in Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me uh, in that prayer. Now, again, we have just covered a series of lessons that was taught by Brother Mahis, looking at the I Ams. You know, there's a lot of things about Jesus that we can learn in Scripture, and we have learned even from these lessons presented by Brother Mahis. And just to remind ourselves, we know that Jesus is the great I Am because of what the Scriptures would have said. And it is interesting that it is mentioned so clearly in these passages that were looked at in view that there should be no doubt in regards to who Jesus is. I am the bread of life, you know. Um, by him you will not hunger, neither thirst. He says he's the good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the light of the world. He's the true vine. All of these things speaks of Jesus as the only one who really and truly is the one that we need to depend on. But then we need to ask ourselves some questions because sometimes people hear lessons and they don't actually are motivated and not moved they, they don't gravitate to to the message that will be able to help save their soul because some people are still looking for perhaps other type of evidence something to say yes this is really so and so i want to go to the text of john uh, chapter number five the gospel according to john chapter number five and in john chapter number five before i read two particular verses I would let you know it was an account where Jesus had came to a particular pool, the pool of Bethesda, and we have a number of impotent folk that are sitting around this pool, 
And the story goes, waiting for the angel to come and stir the pool so that the first person who enters in, they will be healed. And this particular man, as he sits there at the pool, he's waiting, and when the, the pool is stirred, there's no one to take him up and to put him in. But Jesus came, and, and Jesus made a whole lot of difference in his life because of the mere fact that when Jesus came to him, he asked him the question, will thou be made whole? And he said, well, yes, I have nobody to put me in. Everybody goes before me. But then when Jesus said to him, rise, take up thy bed and walk, and he began to experience something that never happened to him in a quite a while, which is to say that he's now walking, it has been a remarkable thing for him now to get up and to start moving. And in that movement, you realize he didn't even think that it was Jesus who actually healed him. So it was a Sabbath day when it happened, the Jews questioned, he came back later on, when he met Jesus, Jesus told him, well listen in verse number 14, behold thou art made whole, sin no more, that's the worst thing happened unto thee. So when he departed, the Jews now were told it was Jesus. It was Jesus who healed the man. And so when Jesus made a statement in verse number 17 where he says, My father worketh hitherto, and I work, the Jews set out to kill him. Wow. Simply because they said that he was making himself equal to God the Father. But I want to read verse 30 and 31. Yes, all the way down to these two verses. It says this, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which had sent me. If I bear witness of myself, he says, my witness is not true. Now, sometimes you realize in the scriptures, upon reading, we don't pay attention to what is being said. Meaning that every time we hear the word of God, there's some form of instruction, enlightenment, admonition, encouragement, but we are not always quick to embrace what is being said, especially when it makes us uncomfortable because there are areas of our lives that we live that need discomforting and the word of God brings that element of discomfort to challenge the way we think, to challenge this discomfort zone we find ourselves in. And so sometimes the word of God is paid no attention to, even though it is read, even though it is heard. And some people prefer to see sermons rather than to hear them. In other words, even by those who are presenting lessons, they want to see examples of what is being presented. But people will also realize that all of us are in the same quest, in the same journey together. That when you read something from the Word of God, it must motivate you to do something. Isaiah is the one who said in chapter 55, that when God's word goes out, it must not return unto him void. It must be able to do something wherever it goes. It must be able to not only resonate in the hearts of men and women, but God stir them up, make a change. Because it has the power to transform lives. Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Which means that it has the ability to cut and to go deep, deep within the heart of man, deep within the soul because it's a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart so we need to actually allow the word of god to go deep within us to bring out the changes that are necessary but some of us rebel because we don't want to be disturbed or to be discomforted especially when you're accustomed doing certain things in life that does not necessarily please god so this message really is for those who have strayed away from God, those who are losing confidence in the fact that if you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, if you obey the gospel of Christ, sometimes you're on shaky ground, sometimes you're not sure whether or not what you're doing, you're supposed to be doing, you're supposed to continue living, and there are those who are outside of the body of Christ, still waiting for evidence, still like Peter and John when they heard the news of Jesus' resurrection and they ran to the tomb, you have one of the disciples outside just looking in to try to find out the evidence of if that is really so. So then we ask ourselves the question, why do we believe then what we believe? Why do we come sometimes to that place of worship? Why do people get themselves dressed and organized to go? And why do some people stay home and don't go at all? I met some people at one time and they would say to me, well, you know what, I don't attend church services. I, I don't really see the need to. And there are those who see the need to and sometimes don't take it seriously. 
So, is there any reality behind what we do? Is there anything to say that will encourage us to make this real and to bring it to pass? Then we ask further question. Does it make sense at all? Pursuing a religious life, pursuing a life that speaks of in the scriptures of spirituality. Does it make us any sense pursuing something that could help balance what we do every day because we focus on the physical and the material but not all the time focus on the spiritual didn't paul already said that the things that are in this world are temporal because it is just for a time but the things that are unseen it's eternal so it's difficult sometimes to focus on things that are eternal when we are so overwhelmed by the physical and the material things then what about this world i'm certainly asking a lot of questions does this word have any authenticity? Does, is this word really the, the word that we need to, to consider today and to move forward into a better life? Well, while we may ask all of those questions, I want to be able to present some historical evidences, to present some facts, to present some historical writings and testimonials because you know what? The word of God in, by itself is sufficient to transform lives and people still look for evidence. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a look at documented evidences coming from historians in the past who, who are believers and non-believers. We're going to look at uh, biblical historical writings that came from God through the apostles, his apostles and prophets, past and early first century. We're also going to consider these testimonials recorded in the Gospels, especially in the book of John or John's Gospel concerning Jesus Christ. Hence the reason why... You know, when Brother Mahes was talking about the, the I am in the, in the gospel according to John, it's filled with evidence. It fills with testimonies. It fills with facts that there should be no doubt in our minds in regards to who Jesus is. So if ever we come across these challenging thoughts, we must know who he is. The gospel according to John and the testimonials recorded by him can help us to know and be convicted that this is real all right that this is real in john the gospel chapter number five if you look carefully with me in verse number 19 the bible says then very very i say unto you the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these also doeth the son likewise for the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that himself doeth and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel it's interesting to know that the relationship between the father and the son is quite evident in scripture some people try to separate the two some people try to say yes we understand that the father is god and he's almighty but the son he's just somebody created by god and people try to separate the son from the father but we must understand in scripture that they are both divine, they are both sacred, they, are both, they both have the same power and everything that goes with the existence of God is the same with the existence of Christ because Christ is also God. And who tells us that? Who confirms that? The Gospel according to John chapter 1 verse 1 and verse number 2. So why are these testimonials and convictions that they written for us to consider? Then the Bible tells us in John 5 30 and verse 31 Jesus made it quite clear that if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So what does he mean by to bear witness of himself? To bear witness means to testify or to give a testimony before a judge. It means to testify to the truth of what one has seen, what one has heard, what one has known. It means also to bear witness concerning a person or thing. So I, I journey to the gospel according to John chapter 1 verse number 6 to verse number 9 and it says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. He became that testimony to give a record of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world so you see what john began to say after making mention that jesus is god in verse number one and verse number two after mention that he created all things in verse number three 
and he talks about the light. He was sent by God. A man sent from God whose name was John and the purpose he was sent is to bear witness or to give that testimony concerning the light. Now we understood who is the light already. John chapter 8 and verse number 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So if John came to give a testimony like that, any other individual who claims to be, in, in a sense, religious or claims to be an icon representing God, that religious icon representing God, has there, any, has there been anyone coming before to give a testimony that this person comes from God? Has anyone came before to give a testimony of those who claim any kind of divinity, for those who claim that, that they are from God, has anyone given a testimony the way John did to prove that yes, they are from God? Well, in verse number 15 of John chapter 1, the scripture says, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So John already knew that the purpose for him coming was just to give a record, to give a testimony of someone to come after him. That's why he says, he must decrease, but he, meaning Christ, must increase. So John could never take the position of being the savior of the world, the position of being the light of the world, the position of being the prophet of the day. Yes, he was a prophet, but he was not the prophet. Because he knew someone else was going to come. So I ask of you the question, all of those who are religious, thinking-minded individuals, if we are holding on to anyone that we say they are God's prophet or anyone that claims to be in that form or measure of superiority, has anyone came before, spoken of in prophecy, to bear witness or to give a testimony that he is the person to come? Has anyone ever done that? Now, to keep it in mind that John's testimony is one in which the people would have been accustomed hearing since the existence of John. Why do I say that? When John came preaching, he was preaching, confessing your sins so that you could prepare yourself for the Christ to come. So John's message was never about promoting himself, it was always about promoting Christ. And that's the second thing I want to say to you at this time. Because of the mere fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the one with whom we need to look forward to for all things, the men who came before him were pointing people in the direction of Christ. They were never taking that glory for themselves. They were never taking that fame for themselves. They were highlighting that Jesus is the one that they needed to listen to. Wow. And that's why the Bible tells us in verse 19, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. And so that is the reason why when we look for evidence, when we look for testimonies that give a understanding, a clear understanding of who Jesus is, we must be able to conclude that John came for the purpose of bearing record to the fact that Jesus is who he said he is. John himself said, I must decrease and he must increase. And so in verse number 29, the next day when John sees Jesus coming unto him, you know what he says? He says, behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the third thing. That the person to come is the only one who could remove sin from the entire world. So John knew he was not the light. He, John knew he was not the person that could bring illumination from those in darkness. All he could do is help prepare people to come to Christ by allowing them the opportunity to repent and to confess their sins. John knew that he was not the light. John knew that he was not Christ. He was not the Messiah, the anointed one to come, as was mentioned in prophecy, even in the book of Isaiah. So it's clear to understand that John could not put himself in that position. He was not the Christ. And thirdly, he does not have the power to remove or even to take away sin from the world. And that's why John says, the one who comes after me is the one who is preferred before me. He was before me. 
So John in verse 32 says, And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it bowed upon him. So John is giving us all of these records, testimonies, that yes, Jesus is the light, the one who has the power to eliminate darkness and bring us into that realm of truth. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. Jesus is indeed by far the only one who can take away our sins. So if we were to look at that simple testimony that John gave and put that next to any man or any woman who tend to put themselves in a the position of Christ, then you must ask the question, are they that light? Are they the Christ? Are they the ones whom Jesus said will take away our sins? No. We can only go with the record stated in scripture of what John says. And John says, Jesus is the light, the Christ, the anointed one, and the one who has the power to take away our sins. If after hearing this message you could conclude in your heart that there is no other person that can give salvation than Christ Jesus, then we encourage you to obey the gospel. Don't hold on to people who don't have that record clearly stated before them, but hold on to Jesus. And I trust that as you hear the gospel, you will believe it, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be baptized to have your sins washed away so you can walk in newness of life. May God bless you. Believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe What the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set me free and me So I might live with him in glory I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. When the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set the people free, so I might live with him